KUAM News Hotspot is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. The homeless situation on Guam does not appear to be getting any better. You see many of them at major intersections holding makeshift signs, asking for help, spare change to buy food. Who are they? They are the old and the young, children even. They are locals and recent immigrants. They live on the streets or makeshift tents with nowhere really to call home. The government and non-government organizations have been trying to help, but as one longtime coordinator tells us, the issues are varied and complicated. There's no one solution that fits all. But to help them, the organizations must find them and know who they are. And the main starting point each year is the Guam Homeless Point in Time Survey. Coming up, we speak with a chairperson and vice chair of the Guam Homeless Coalition who need your help so they can help the homeless. The Hub will be right back after this. Hi everyone and welcome once again to The Hub, the first one of 2024. I'm joined uh, this week, I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Samantha Taichno, who is the chairperson of the Guam Homeless Co Coalition, and uh, Rob St. Augustine, who is with the office of, uh, of OHAP. And I'll ask them to just explain their role and what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Samantha, Samantha, we'll start with you. Okay, so good morning and happy new year. Um, yes, so I am the current chairperson for the Guam Homeless Coalition, um, which means that I just really kind of help uh, lead the different efforts that we um, put together throughout the year. Um, the Guam Homeless Coalition is really um, a group of uh, government and then also nonprofit organizations and concerned citizens that really come together to work towards um, ending homelessness and supporting those who are experiencing homelessness right now. And so just uh, really happy to be here this morning, and I'll give it over to Rob, who's actually also um, the vice chair of the Bomb Plus Coalition. Right. Thank you, Sam, and happy new year to everyone. Um, so yes, so uh, OHAP is otherwise known as the uh, or its Office of Homelessness Assistance and Poverty Prevention, uh, otherwise known as OHAP. Um, so we're the, the government side um, of the homeless response um, for the administration and the Office of the Governor. Um, and then I am also, as Sam said, we're the, I'm the vice chair for the coalition. So um, it's a good way to, to partner the nonprofit side and the government side. Um, it's been pretty effective um, for, I think Sam and I have been the, the officers for the last about a year now. Um, so it's, it's been a good way to, to loop in, you know, nonprofit side government, um, even working closely with the mayor's uh, office. And uh, this was, you know, pretty effective even during the typhoon time. So um now i guess our, our main focus is going to be the pit count yeah and, and and that's the reason i invited you guys on to talk about the uh the point in in time survey that um you guys do every year but before we get to that i wanted to talk a little bit more about the homeless situation on guam uh its history and 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 what's been done and and why it is what it is now um I can remember as far back as you know when when the uh, the homelessness was you know more the exception than what we're seeing now, right? Um, you you rarely would see people on the streets, you know, um, asking for money and that sort of thing. Typically, what we would see back then, what we started to see when when the first homelessness that we used to see was um, folks coming from off island, is and, I, and I, as I understand it, it was. Um, from Hawaii, the um, social services there gave them a ticket to come to Guam, and we never really determined how and when they left or or, or that sort of thing. And that's the kind of homelessness we saw, which was, um, you know, people from off island coming to Guam. But then we started seeing more and more um, local um, folks um, uh, in the same situation. And uh, Sam, let me start with you. Uh, what's your um, assessment of of, of the history of, of homelessness and how it, that's uh, developed over the years in Guam. Yes, so, um, you know, as you kind of mentioned, it used to be sort of the exception, you know, more than what we would see, you know, today. Um, according to our pit count that we did last year, we actually saw 1,075 people who were unhoused on the island, and that's both um, people who are in some of the emergency or transitional housing shelters, and then also those who are street homeless. And um, 
really, whenever I talk about, you know, homelessness and being unhoused, it's very complex. It's complicated. It's not just one thing that really leads to it. It's a, a series of um, unfortunate events, a series of poor choices um, that can sometimes lead people there. Um, I don't want people to think that it's all just because of drugs or mental health issues, um, but those are definitely contributing factors. Um, and, you know, just as we see the island continually continuing to evolve, um, it also means that sort of those social constructs are, are ever changing as well. Um, and, and that's kind of also part of it as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and um, the coalition um, has been around, uh, gosh, I wish I, I believe um, almost 10 years. We haven't even been around for 10 years yet. And um, if I'm correct, um, but, you know, really it was, you know, out of seeing sort of, you know, that it was becoming to be an emerging issue and uh, throughout the years. And then especially um, since the pandemic, you know, that also kind of further exasperated things. Um, the typhoon further exasperated things. And you're finding people who are just, you know, become into situations where they're in households that are overly full. And sometimes they rather, you know, or sometimes they rather um, be outside of the house or, you know, something happens with family conflict. So, you know, it's just, it's extremely complex um, to kind of get into all of the different reasons why people find themselves unhoused. But the coalition with the partnerships that we make, um, are really trying to work towards, you know, preventing and ending it and supporting those who are experiencing it. Um, but also um, know that the coalition, um, as a group of organizations, the coalition doesn't actually itself operate any of the shelters or have any programs by itself as like the organization um, that actually does the work. We support the different nonprofit organizations and government agencies that actually have the programs and have the infrastructure and capacity to really run the programs effectively. Um, a, a lot of our programs um, that the members have are all federally funded, which means that they have very strict guidelines that they need to follow to ensure that they are being accountable for the funds that they're expending. And so that also can sometimes become a barrier. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Rob because he yeah. actually has um, a federal program um, that does assist people. Yeah, right, and OHAP, Rob, is, is, is under you and, and, and that's pretty much your role, yeah? Yes, um, so yes, um, you know, on the government side, I think I, I was trying to do some research on just the history of, of homelessness also. Um, you're right, back in the day, we didn't see many. Um, and so we are seeing, you know, when we do some outreaches and we'll discuss with the, the, our other partners, uh, we do see some that, you know, we haven't seen before, you know, we'll go talk to them and like where they come from. Um, and and I think, you know, I just, just from, from my side, from the office side, I think we've been seeing maybe, you know, one person, you know, new person a month out on the street, just like not from here. Um, so we're trying to figure out, you know, where they're coming from, what we can do to, um, you know, reunite them with family if they're off island, because normally we'll, you know, interview them, ask them where they come from, where's your family, um, and, and just try to help them um, return because a, a lot of the stories sometimes they they come here for maybe a job they get stuck and they have no way to um, you know get back home if they you know their their identification got stolen all their things got stolen so um, that's one side of that um, on the local side we do see a lot of local families also that are faced with being unhoused and that is again uh, like Sam said a lot of it is you know overcrowded housing, you know, multi-generational houses that, you know, uh, you know, sometimes they, they get in a fight and they'd rather leave and that's how they diffuse the situation. Um, so one thing that uh, would help, I think, uh, is, is just being able to cope, you know, helping families be able to be able to cope and work through conflict um, so that it, that doesn't become the situation because once you're in that situation, it's, it is hard to get out of it. Um, and it's just kind of surviving and, and it's a day-to-day -day type thing where, you know, especially if it's not a single person, if it's family and you have kids, you know, that's even even worse. Um, we do see even a lot of, uh, well, some, not a lot, but there's are some even the elderly um, individuals and, and couples that that are scared to get help from their families because they're, you know, they're saying my kids have, you know, they have a house, but I don't like staying there. I don't want to bother them. They have their own thing going on. Um, so there are a lot of different things we have to work through um, when we first uh, meet with them. 
and just try to understand their situation, uh, what they need, what they have, um, if they have, if they need some of the public benefits, food stamps, things that can help them survive, and then try to figure out what they need to do, if they can work, if they want, you know, you know, we'll try to get them to like Department of Labor, we'll try to, you know, get them to public health of the benefits. So um, as much as we can to connect them to things that, that will help themselves um, to reach that uh, next level of being able to sustain themselves. Um, that's our main job as a coalition, even as OHAP, and as government agencies, is trying to help people um, not be, you know, I, from our, you know, our mission statements to regain their ability from their vulnerability. Yeah, you know, some some cynics in the community might might see these folks, some of these folks um, on the streets, you know, asking for assistance, and 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 might feel like, you know, you it, you look like an able-bodied person. Why are you not working? You know, you, you might see that added to what, what's what's your guys' response to that? Well, when when I kind of hear things like that, I, I really think about the fact that becoming unhoused and then being unhoused, there's a lot of trauma involved in that. And some people are just trying to, as Rob said, make it day to day, looking for the next meal, trying to make sure that they're safe, that they don't even, you know, the thought of that, of working isn't as important as, you know, when, when is my next meal? Where am I going to stay? So it's also, like Rob said, it's it's working with them, trying to get them to a place where they feel safe and secure, that they can take those next steps to really, you know, get back on their feet and, and you know, maybe find work. So. Yeah. You want to add to that, Rob? Um, yeah, I, I, I know when, when people uh, see, you know, the, the panhandling things, they do think there is an element, like maybe a criminal element of what's going on. They're just, you know, or they are just lazy um, and things like that. But, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of partly everything. You know, it's if, if they don't feel that they can get a job or, you know, sometimes it might be just an easier way. Um, they know people will get some money. I, I do. We have come across some people where they are making more money than, you know, if they go out and get a job. So, um it, it's kind of different things, different motivations um, that we have to, to take a look at. Um, if it is the easy route where, um, you know, they are making more more money than there's that, but um, our job would be to to contact those people that that want to work and have that that stability and that uh, their own, you know, self, uh, um, you know, their, their own goals to reach. Um, and those are the people that we would be able to help more and then you know those those that are out there just trying to to make it day by day um you know we'll, we'll help them as much as we can uh i guess have a different perspective over time where they can you know start thinking uh, about different things aside from survival um so yeah. that's, that's and, and for the yeah and for the local homeless um it used to be that the the social safety net if you will was the family and that has been increasingly not the case yeah Right. Uh, yeah. As over the years, uh, families have grown and the properties haven't. You know, we, we are facing uh, limited land and that's just everybody. Uh, so I think once, um, you know, the families get bigger and the spaces get smaller and, and then, you know, they're, they're faced with, you know, the, the jobs and, and education, things like that, um, it, it does become a strain. And so that support system gets strained. Um, once the, el you know, the, the, the family, the mothers and fathers and grandfathers uh, and grandmothers pass away and they're on family property. And then that starts a conflict in the family on who gets to stay where. Um, and it's just, it just becomes a, that, that family thing where the family gets strained and it's, it's a you know, kind of a struggle for survival for everyone. Yeah. Uh, on, on that note, uh, we got to take a break. Uh, we'll be back with uh, our discussion with uh, Samantha Tyson and Rob San Augustine of the Guam Homeless Coalition right after this break. Please stay with us. All right, welcome back everyone. We're talking with uh, Samantha Titano and Rob San Augustine of the Guam Homeless Coalition. And actually what they're here to talk about most is uh, an upcoming a point in time survey. And Sam, let me start with you. Can you tell us uh, what the point in time survey is and, and of course what its purpose is. 
Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the Guam Homeless Coalition is actually the continuum of care for Guam. And so that is a, a housing and urban development kind of program. And so that's where we get some of our funding. And one of the requirements um, as the COC is really to hold this annual um, point in time um, homeless count. And it's really supposed to be a unduplicated count of anybody who is unhoused living on Guam. And so it's a full day um, event. Um, where people go out. Um, of course, we provide training ahead of time because it's all volunteers that are, are going out to do these surveys. And um, we collect housing surveys to understand a little bit more about their situation, um, their challenges, what are their needs. And then of course, um, we always provide care bags um, afterwards. And so it's, it's really a, a huge effort of um, people kind of coming out from either government agencies, nonprofits, and like I said, just everyday volunteers um, that are are looking to help us gain a better understanding. And all of the yeah. data that we collect is really what helps us in, inform us about what kind of programs we need to start focusing on as a coalition. Um, and, and also all of that data, you know, we provide it to anybody, um, government agencies, nonprofits, so that they can also use that data in any other sort of grants that they're they're trying to look for. Yeah, and, and you, Rob, um, you guys don't need just a few. You need about two or three hundred. Yes, uh, I, th I think we are looking for three hundred volunteers this year. Um, as I said, we are, you know, we use our our own coalition members. We have uh, call out to anyone in the community actually that would like to to do that. Um, students, um, other organizations that are out there, community stakeholders. Um, yeah, so we have. Uh, we're putting together about 500 bags. So there's not only the day of, we have preps, uh, people that come in to load up the bags. Um, and then we have our volunteers that are, are put in teams for that day. And then we go out to the different sites. Um, we have, gosh, there's a list of, of maybe over 150 sites that we have listed down um, that the teams are supposed to be going out. And like Sam said, that's a whole day affair on the last Friday of the month. Um, so we are we're looking forward forward to it, uh, seeing how the numbers changed over from last year. Yeah, and and so give us an idea of what the the training is involved and what those dates are for people who are who might be interested. Okay, so um, for volunteers, the only real requirements that we have is that you're 18 years or older. Um, so we're only looking for adults to be part of this, um, be able to attend the one day training. Um, and then also just be physically capable of walking in different terrains, because there are some that are kind of like more um, in more remote areas um, and be able to carry the care bags, which are usually about 20 pounds. Um, for dates, for our training dates, um, we are looking at between January 16 and 18. Um, it's just a one day training, but those are the different options that you are able to, to join us. And it's about from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and so, as Rob mentioned, we put everybody in teams because safety is always going to be our biggest priority. Um, and even if you are a new volunteer, um, you are always welcome to kind of um, put in if you, you know, if it's a group of friends, you know, you can always put in, but we'll always make sure that there's a veteran um, volunteer who will be with you um, just to make sure, uh, you know, that everything goes as smoothly as possible. We also make sure that we keep in contact with our volunteers at all times. So we have WhatsApp chat groups um, all set up. And then of course um, the phone stuff, um, we have, you know, you can always call us on phones and everything. And then even when, um, especially the more experienced volunteers know that once they kind of go into remote areas, sometimes there is a loss of phone service. So they'll usually check in right before they go in. And then of course, um, when they when they come out. And then, like I said, um, January 26th is gonna be the actual pit count. Um, we say all day, but don't worry, your team won't be out there all day. Um, some of the volunteers, a lot of the veteran, um, more experienced volunteers will go out as early as 3 a.m., but most of the shifts start around 6 to 8, and we give you a full map. Um, and during the training, we we teach people how to fill out the survey. We, um, you know, show them how to, you know, what kind of safety precautions they should be taking. Um, and then we also kind of um, help them to be able to read the maps because we provide them with all of the maps, showing them the areas that they'll be responsible um, for um, uh, doing the count in so that we, again, we don't have any duplications um, of people. And so um, th that's the actual day of the pit count. 
Um, but we're also going to be packing all of those care bags, 500 care bags, which will be a combination of canned and dry goods, and then also hygiene supplies. And that's going to be happening on January 24th. So we have lots of opportunities um, to get involved um, in really helping um, with the pit count this year. All right, Sam, I think we might have lost uh, Rob, so I'm going to have to stick with you if you don't no mind. <laughs> um, I, I do want to, uh, to understand, um, how, how is it that you guys um, determine where to look? Um, because obviously these folks are homeless. So um, how, how do you um, pick out the areas to search for them? Okay, so um, the coalition, we have a lot of uh, member organizations, especially on the nonprofit site, that do regular street outreach. And so um, they're going out onto, into the community on a weekly basis um, to, ch to check in with existing clients, to meet with people who might be new. Um, and really from there, um, we kind of make sure that we collect all of that data and that information. Um, and so that helps to compile, but then we also reach out to our mayors. We know that our mayors are, you know, they, they know their villages, they have a good understanding of, you know, who might be unhoused. And so we reach out to them and then we're also looking at reaching out to, to GPD to see if they also know of any other, you know, spots that, that might. But, you know, if there's anybody who's in the community that wants to make sure that a specific area is covered, that we might not know about, you know, we're always um, open to, to receiving any suggestions about areas just to make sure that we have it on our map, make sure that we're counting everybody. All right. And we do have Rob back. So I wanted to ask you, Rob, um, so who collects all this data and uh, who forms the report and, and how has it disseminated the, the results of it? Okay. Apologies at a power outage, but I had to jump on my phone. So um, this, all of this information is gathered um, by the uh, Salvation Army, so it's all of the referrals are put into the homeless uh, HMIS, which is the Homeless Management Information System. Um, and so this report is, is given to the federal side, the HUD side. And once they look at the numbers and they accept the numbers, um, they will approve it. And then the report will come out, um, report back out and given back to Gura. And that's when Gura posts it to um, the community here. That's normally, I believe, around uh, the, the last quarter of the year. All right. And so we're running out of time. And Sam, I'll just give you, uh, let you uh, wrap it up for us uh, just to invite folks who might want to volunteer and let them know that uh, you need their help. Yes. So um, like I said, the Guam Homeless Coalition is really in need of about 300 volunteers this year. Um, we are almost at about 50 percent of that. Um, we're looking to close um, the registration for volunteers on January 12th. And so if you are interested in volunteering, if you're interested in learning more about the coalition and what it means to be a pit count volunteer, you can always check us out on our social media, Guam Homeless Coalition. Um, and that's on Instagram and Facebook. We have links to everything and we've been putting out a lot of informative posts just to really kind of answer any of those questions. Also, you can always visit our website, which is Guam, Guam Homeless Coalition.org. And there again, we have lots of information about the dates, um, and about the how to register, what the pit count is, and how you can become part of it. So um, we encourage you guys to, to come check it out. And then you can always send us a message either on socials or through our contact page on our email. Um, and we'll be happy to, to respond to you. So thank All you. All right. I uh, hope you have a successful uh, pit count there. Uh, Sam Titano, Rob St. Augustine of the Guam Homeless Ca Coalition. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Happy to hear, everybody. Happy All right. I'm Nestor Lecanto. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again next week on The Hub.